If you've ever blown out your eardrums by hitting backspace on Kelly Linux one too many times, ladies and gentlemen, go ahead, hit those like and subscribe buttons. Today, let's review a zero day. Today, I'd like to spend as much time as possible talking about a vulnerability that I've found. And to do that, we have to answer some questions. First and foremost, what is a zero day? Zero day is basically a vulnerability that's known to the researcher that found it and basically nobody else. So that would include vendors, developers, manufacturers, etc. Zero days are often used in criminal hacking campaigns and massive malware campaigns. They're very expensive on the black market depending on what exactly that vulnerability pertains to but sometimes they're also used in penetration tests and red team assessments although keep in mind it's really dependent on the scope set for penetration tests and even with red team assessments it's still kind of limited by scope but usually red team assessments are a little more relaxed in that regard why would you want to find one well they make products safer through responsible disclosure. You can contribute back to the security community. We can beef up our resumes and our experiences. Maybe get some cash on bug bounties. And finding zero days makes us look cool. And let me tell you this, the most important hacker skill that you can possibly develop is looking cool. Okay, so let's jump into some of the more technical aspects. Zero day that I found earlier this year was documented under CV 2020-7209. This was a remote code execution vulnerability in an open source product. From my understanding of this project by Hewlett Packard, it was intended to be a sort of troubleshooting tool for system administrators, but there's some other diagnostic functionality built into it comes as a web application, but it also comes in the form of a Docker container. And that's what we'll be looking at today. So how did I find this? And what was my process for actually going about developing an exploit for it? Well, a online friend of mine pointed me to Volney Code, which is a PHP code static analysis tool. For finding zero days, you are usually going to go through one of two methodologies for finding them. One being static analysis, the other one being fuzzing or you know some other form of dynamic analysis. So if you've heard either of those two terms, that's usually what they're referring to is that initial research aspect of where vulnerabilities come from. So after my friend told me about this project, we started playing around with GitHub just to see what it could do with open source projects. And we stumbled upon the code searching functionality within GitHub. And that's not a new feature, but it is a very useful feature. And GitHub's API allows for you to search through the API for code snippets. And that's where my idea for this project came from, which is GitHub Autopone. It essentially takes the features of Volney static code analysis and ties it in as a wrapper for GitHub's APIs. You can search through it by username in its current form, and you can also search by particular code snippets that are known to have security issues if they're implemented poorly. So let's git clone this and run this against DVWA. Let's say we wanted to search for all potential instances of shell exec within DVWA. The way we would do that with autopone is by doing python3 autopone. Get rid of this junk. And we are going to set a search query for shell exec. And most importantly, we want to see the code snippets, so we will specify the minus G option. We got a little bit too much information back, but you can kind of get the gist of it. So it'll basically go through GitHub's API. It'll look through all of the application files, and it'll try to do a regular expression search for that particular function. So how did this resort in a zero day in a Hewlett Packard product? I essentially use GitHub Autopone to search for shell exec across their repositories, and I was greeted with some indicators that said, hey, there might be shell exec in 
these three files. The next step that I did, so I went to this link and this is the currently patched version. So you'll probably notice that we have some things in here that used to work that no longer work. But previously I saw that some of these parameters were being passed to shell exec functions that weren't sanitized. So that's how that came about. So once we have identified a potentially vulnerable instance, how do we actually go about finding a vulnerability? So to do that, I downloaded the Docker image from the Linux KI project. And in here, there is a file called kivis start, which will spin up a Docker container. So now that the Docker container is running, we can start testing live. But just to show you exactly where this vulnerability occurred, we need to go to this directory. So to really understand this vulnerability, we need to assess how this web application works. And one immediate thing that jumped out at me was that this application does not require a session. So why is that important? Well, with no session required, that means that this is always going to be remote unauthenticated. So we never have to log into this. Although to be fair, I don't think this web application requires authentication in any aspect. What are some other things that we need to do? So for us to get started developing an exploit for this, there's some other parameters that we need to address. So where do we want to land? Well, I can see right here that this little code snippet requires the PID parameter, TS parameter, a start parameter, and an end parameter. So there's really not a whole lot that we need to do to get successful remote code execution on this function. So starting at the end, do we need to actually set this variable? No. No, there's nothing that we need to do here. Same with the start variable, same with the TS variable. So although we don't need these three previous variables, we do need to set the PID variable. So let's add that to our notes. So we need to set PID. Tracing this back further, we also need to set a type. That's going to be done via another get parameter. We're kind of doing this in reverse order, right? So we need to set type. Backtracing this a little further, what else do we need to specify? We need to specify which directory that this file falls under. So for that, this is going to be something like hostname, port, and that's going to be experimental, vis, and then kibis.php. So remember, the, the way that that code snippet is written we don't have to set any of the three ladder variables we just need to set these two so going back to the code we need to set a type equal to kytrace and then we need to set a pid to some random number and to be fair i don't think it matters what number you sent you set it to we need to set kytrace and we need to set pid equal to one, two, three, four, just as an example. So next we need to understand how we escape this sequence. Shell exec is interesting in that it's almost a one-to-one -one command from PHP into the shell environment. So essentially what this PHP script is doing is it is executing something like this on the command line. So one way that we can escape this is we can try going for a semicolon and then the ID command. Alternatively, we can also try double ampersands and the ID command, but there's also a number of other ways that we can try and escape this. But for the purposes of successful exploitation, let's go to this directory and let's check this out. So from the information that we gathered earlier, we need to set the type parameter to kytrace, and then we need to set the PID parameter to some random number. So we see that we get something that looks like a bash command, Let's see if we get similar output just running it as is. And it looks like that is the case. So what we've gained from this information is that the script directly passes some of these parameters in, into a command line structure. Do id, do semicolon, id, semicolon. And there we have remote code execution. So just as another test, let's try cat etsy password. There you have it. 
So for the sake of time, I figured it'd be easier to just go over the exploit that I submitted to exploit database. And now that we have the exploit downloaded, let's copy it to our current directory. But first, let's make a new directory and we'll call this call this Linux Kai exploit. We will copy from and we will change this to a Python file called exploit.py. So with this exploit, we're essentially doing the same thing that we just did in the browser. However, in this case, in an automated fashion. So we set our host and port parameters. We set via the command line the, that we wish to run. And then we specify the vulnerable path to the kivis.php file with the parameters that we discovered earlier. And I'll explain this in a second, but um, we we also use an echo begin and an echo end, and we specify the command line command that we wish to run via percent %s. The exploit then submits a get request to this URL with the host and port parameters specified. It then stores the output, and with that output, it does a regular expression on the begin and end echo statements, and it will print the output in between. And that should give us a nice clean output. So let's go back to the browser. Let's make sure that we have the right parameters set. And then we'll specify the command that we wish to run on the Docker image. Excellent. And then just as proof, we get the Docker host name. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching this video. I hope it was educational, and I understand I have a little bit of a strange speaking style, but I assure you that is just because I haven't seen anybody in six whole months. Gaining the ability to find zero days is extremely powerful, so please use this knowledge for good. I understand in terms of zero days, this one is relatively insignificant. You know, there's a lot more impressive products out there to find vulnerabilities in, but it is a very good skill to acquire and it will absolutely help you out with your career. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining me and we'll see you in the next one.